Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Before we begin, I want to make certain that our recording has started as well. Fabulous. All right. Um, good evening. Hello, and my name is Heidi Lang, and I serve as the Pre-Health Professions Advisor here at Saginaw Valley State University, and I'd like to welcome our in-person guests. We also welcome those of you that are joining us virtually, um, so we welcome all of you to our campus. We are grateful to host tonight's lecture, which is titled The Pandemic to Emergency, New Challenges in Childhood and Adolescent Mental Health, and to engage with all of you on this necessary topic. This lecture is part of the Your Health Lecture Series, which is created by Michigan State University's College of Human Medicine. And in addition to MSU, tonight's lecture has co-sponsors of SVSU, My Michigan Health in Midland, and also Alma College. We thank our partner sponsors for making this possible. Tonight, we welcome to the podium, Dr. Heidi Rawlings and Dr. Bradley Demijohn to share on this important topic. Dr. Rawlings is a child and adolescent psychiatrist at Pine Rest Christian Mental Health Services in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She is a training director for Pine Rest Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Pro Fellowship Program, and she is an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at Michigan State. She works clinically in outpatient and residential treatment programming, and she also works with pediatric groups in West Michigan to support the behavioral health care treatment of children in the pediatric setting. Bradley Demijohn is a graduate of Central Michigan University's College of Medicine. He is now a first-year child and adolescent psychiatry fellow, also at Pine Rest in Grand Rapids, and he is interested in pursuing a career in outpatient psychiatry services. Representing SVSU, I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge that Dr. Demijohn completed his pre-medical requirements with us here on campus. We are delighted to welcome them um, to the university, and Dr. Demijohn, we welcome you back to campus. We are going to um, spend about 45 minutes or so with some good presentation. We ask that you would hold your questions to the end. For those of you joining us in the virtual world, um, we are going to be very mindful of using the microphone so you can also hear the questions and you are welcome and invited to send your questions in and we will address those at the end. But if you will now um, join me in welcoming both Dr. Rawlings and Dr. Jemmy Don for the presentation. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, got a note situation here. So if it looks like I'm looking at my phone here, it, it, I am. Um, All right, so we have some objectives for um, our topic tonight. First, we wanna review childhood development concepts. Um, we're going to explore the impact of disruptions caused by the pandemic. Um, we also want to identify some of the common presenting behavioral health symptoms in children. Um, and then we will also discuss stressors um, and supports for children in school. Yeah, we'll see that. Um, so the inspiration of this presentation um, comes out of an announcement on October 19th, um, 21, from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association. Um, they declared a national state of emergency in children's mental health. Um, they had noted major increases in emergency room visits for all mental health emergencies, including suspected suicide attempts. There are more than 140,000 children in the U.S. lost a primary and or secondary caregiver with minority children disproportionately impacted. Soaring rates of depression, anxiety, trauma, loneliness, and suicidality. Um, in 2018, suicide was the second leading cause of death for youths aged 10 to 24. So some numbers here. Um, for depression, uh, these are global numbers, by the way. Pre-pandemic depression levels were 12.9%. During the pandemic, 25.2%. Uh, looking at anxiety, pre-pandemic, pandemic numbers were 11.6%, and then during the pandemic, 20.5%. So significant increases here. Um, so there are a lot of theoretical frameworks to look at child development. Um, 
choosing Erickson's uh, theory of psychosocial development here to kind of compare the impacts of the um, quarantine and pandemic on children developing through these stages. We'll only cover the first five here, trust versus mistrust, autonomy versus shame and doubt, initiative versus guilt, industry versus inferiority, and identity versus role confusion, as those are gonna be our child and adolescent topics or age groups. So trust versus mistrust, uh, this is infancy to one years of age. In this stage, the child is faced with the existential question, can I trust the world? Uh, infants will rely on parents, especially the mother, for needs such as warmth, safety, dependable affection, and sustenance. If these needs are consistently met, the child should develop a sense of trust in the caregiver um, and the general understanding that the, the others are dependable and reliable. If needs go unmet, the child may become anxious. Um, they might learn to mistrust others. Uh, later in life, Erickson theorized that uh, mistrust will lead to frustration, suspicion, withdrawal, and uh, poor confidence, as the worldview is that of an unpredictable, dangerous place. It's easy to see how a more neurotic personality type could develop from, from some of these deficits. The um, coronavirus quarantine's impact here could be both positive and negative. On one hand, lockdowns brought families together within the home. This provided um, a lot of opportunity to create more secure attachments. Uh, however, it was not always that easy as many of us probably have experienced. Um, the upheaval of the pandemic caused many to have to work from home, uh, many to work in the home with multiple children. Some lost their jobs. Uh, daycares were closed indefinitely early in the pandemic. And then later in the pandemic, they would close without warning, uh, leaving parents to figure that out. There were many additional demands on parents that uh, made consistency and routine within the home an impossibility. Um, certainly there's a lot of concern of how well a parent in survival mode trying to navigate all these things can provide consistent warmth um, and that dependable affection. Early in the pandemic, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended infection control practices that included temporary maternal infant separation. Um, this was to protect newborn babies uh, from the coronavirus, but given um, that need for that connection, can see where this would be problematic. Even long after birth, um, parents that tested positive later might have chosen to self-quarantine from their babies. Um, you can imagine how confusing this is for the newborn as well. I want to note, too, that... Um, these are not meant to be judgment in any shape or form, these examples. Um, I think we had to make a lot of decisions on the fly through the pandemic. So if you had to quarantine from your baby, I think you were doing that with uh, the best in mind. So just want to put that out there. The next stage of development is autonomy versus shame and doubt. Uh, this is early childhood, one to two years old. Here the child faces the existential question, is it okay to be me? At this stage, the child is beginning to explore the world around them. Uh, the parent serves as a safe anchor for them to explore from. Um, as this exploration advances, the child will learn that they can satisfy some of their own needs, whether it be feeding themselves or reaching a toy across the room. This stage is a balancing act for the parent. Uh, they must support and encourage exploration while also providing adequate protection for that child. Patience as the child tries new things and encouragement to do so will help foster self-sufficient behaviors in that child and they will develop a sense of autonomy and a confidence that they can take on new challenges. On the other hand, demanding too much, not providing enough time to try new things um, or even protection when in excess, when in excess will lead to a lack of opportunity for that child to develop new skills. So COVID-19 led to a lot of fear and uncertainty. Uh, the invisible threat could be anywhere in the air, on every surface, carried by any person, even those that were previously really close to the child. Uh, this likely forced a lot of parents into increasingly protective practices, uh, unintentionally instilling a fear of this invisible threat and um, really limiting opportunity to explore their world and try new things. 
initiative versus guilt. This is preschool age, age three to six. Um, the preschool age child will face the existential question, is it okay for me to do, to move, or to act? Um, this stage builds upon the previous, so initiative really flows from that sense of autonomy that the child develops. Here, the child attempts to move beyond exploration and now seeks to master the world around them. Um, they begin to learn how the world works, um, start to understand that things will fall down, not up, that round objects roll, concrete hurts, grass doesn't hurt so much. Um, the child will begin to act with purpose, but uh, undesired results or failure might lead to guilt. Initiative needs are similar to those of autonomy, but begin to involve more than the parent. Um, they will include teachers and other caregivers. They continue to need encouragement and support, but guilt is a really confusing emotion um, for the preschool age child. And a parent may observe aggression, such as throwing or hitting in response to a disrupted goal um, and the failure that comes out of that disrupted goal. The attentive caregiver will help, help that child make better choices to achieve their goals in the future. If successful, the child will develop a healthy sense of initiative, um, a belief that they can try new things. Discouragement or a lack of praise for attempts will lead to the development of guilt over the child's needs and desires. And without proper guidance and establishing boundaries for the child, they might develop unhealthy ways to approach initiative. COVID had a lot of impact on preschool age children. Um, these children were uprooted from school, um, any extracurricular activities they were involved in, uh, quarantines and fear of infection caused uh, children to no longer be able to explore a lot of their world. Um, the classroom or daycare, uh, these were prime environments for learning new tasks, but these were replaced with screens. For the preschool age child, they had already developed some new skills and masteries uh, things that they likely previously received praise for, uh, but seemingly overnight, some of these things were now dangerous and frowned upon. Um, it's easy to see how confusing this would be for a child who had once got praise for one task and suddenly they're being discouraged for doing it. Further nonverbal cues of encouragement, um, simple as a smile or laughing, were very difficult for the child to interpret as we were all wearing masks. <laughs> The next stage is industry versus inferiority. Um, this is middle childhood, age seven to 10 years. The, this child faces the existential question, can I make it in the world of people and things? So children are developing an eagerness to learn and attempt increasingly complex skills, such as reading, writing, understanding time. They begin to develop moral values. This is a critical stage where self-confidence begins to develop. In school, um, in front of peers, children have the opportunity to, to succeed and receive prayer for producing things such as new drawings, uh, performing math problems, reading aloud, or even writing sentences. Praise for producing, this incentivizes that they develop perseverance and a capacity to prioritize work over play. The industrious child will begin to discover their own talents and interests, such as an athletic child pursuing sports, or a child interested in music learning to play a new instrument. There is an increasing um, interest in relationships and social groups um, for these children. And all of this helps develop that sense of self and individual competence. If the children are unable to meet the demands around them and they do not receive the encouragement or praise that they need, they may develop these feelings of inferiority um, of their own capabilities. Without opportunity to discover and pursue these talents um, and interests, they may suffer from lack of motivation and low self-esteem. So coronavirus removed many of the supports and encouragements that children need to develop confidence in developing industry. The entire uh, education system was turned on its head. Uh, both teachers, parents, and the students themselves were really struggling at the same time to find a new equilibrium in a really challenging world. A learning environment among peers was, was broken. Kids could no longer do things together. Um, many of the learning milestones became suddenly more complex as the classroom environment was now uh, replaced to 
virtual learning at the kitchen table. So discovery of personal interest was really disrupted as many of the extracurricular activities ended overnight as well. And there were far fewer opportunities for socialization or developing social groupings. And those that had developed were now limited to virtual socializing. So the last phase we will go over here is identity versus role confusion. Um, this includes adolescents age 13 to 19 years old. And the existential question here is who am I and what can I be? This phase is a little bit different in that everyone navigates role confusion um, often through their entire life. And the goal is to achieve identity um, through that confusion. At this stage, children really require continued support and encouragement from significant relationships to achieve a sense of self and a self sense of independence. Uh, this identity extends to occupation, gender roles, politics, religion, um, any, and many more. The child may become uh, more influenced by an increasing degree of their peers and seek identity with greater independence from their parents. Uh, teenagers need a lot of time and space um, to experiment with activities that will help them merge their physical self, their personality, and the potential roles they may play in the world. Much of this discovery is done in social contexts with a multitude of selected peers. As teens begin to establish their own ideologies, um, they're inevitably going to come up against societal opposition. So consider the adolescent developing a more liberal worldview in a conservative household. If societal challenges, or in this example, family opposition, are too insistent, the teen may capitulate to those demands, ending their exploration of this identity, and thus any self-discovery that might come out of that. This early termination of exploration is likely to inhibit identity formation and cause that role confusion we were concerned about. So again, COVID was very disruptive. Um, Quarantine forced teens away from their peers where they were really trying to develop identity and back into the dependence on their parents where they were trying to create space. Um, social circles were very disrupted. Now teens had to navigate this role confusion in a world that no longer made sense. Even teens who had begun to develop a strong identity and sense of purpose in the world may have found themselves quite confused when the world no longer existed due to COVID. I know the uh, age range says 19, but this is a pretty fluid stage. And I was thinking of a lot of our um, medical students and pre-med students trying to navigate this COVID crisis and what that meant for your future careers and uh, a lot of challenge in that. Um, there we go. So we're gonna transition now into discussing some symptoms um, of concern relating to anxiety and depression. Um, as mentioned earlier, this mental health crisis was announced um, as depression and anxiety rates in children and adolescents essentially doubled. This has really exacerbated the shortage of psychiatrists, especially those with child and adolescent training. Um, this is putting a lot of pressure on primary care providers and they're treating a lot more complex mood disorders out of necessity as patients wait months for therapy or to see a psychiatrist. Um, so anxiety, anxiety related to threats or danger are a normal stage of child development. However, once there is impaired functioning, it definitely warrants more exploration. So children are more likely to experience anxiety in situations involving school or sports. Um, while adolescents a little older have more anxiety around social gatherings and focus. Typically, anxiety is associated with worry, but you may also, it may also present with restlessness. There may be difficulty concentrating. Grades might start to slip. There may be a concern from the parent of ADHD where it was not previously a concern. Um, there may be fatigability. Our children might be much more exhausted at the end of the day at the end of the day at school uh, than they once were. Um, sleep problems such as difficulty falling asleep or waking up multiple times. We may see more irritability. They may be avoidant of things that they used to enjoy. Um, 
Parents may report their child is crying more often, um, or there may be relational conflicts with peers and parents. A couple of physical symptoms that we might see in children that are struggling with anxiety might include headaches, um, vague body pain. We see a lot of stomach pain. Um, my belly hurts is a frequent one we hear from anxious children. Um, I'm gonna, I think, I think we can pass this slide for this presentation and this one. Um, so I do wanna go over anxiety treatment. Um, so psychotherapy uh, should be first line for mild or moderate anxiety. Um, Well-established treatments with the most supportive evidence include cognitive behavioral therapy, exposure therapy, uh, CBT with parent included, and CBT combined with medication. Uh, when CBT is used to treat anxiety, the patient is really taught to recognize symptoms of their anxiety. And then these symptoms then serve to as cues that they can use um, to use learned coping strategies. CBT helps the child or adolescent understand core beliefs that lead into feelings of anxiety, and they begin to recognize maladaptive automatic thoughts that come from negative core beliefs. Once they're able to start recognizing these automatic thoughts, they can start to challenge them and really develop new, more adaptive thought habits. Uh, for more moderate or severe anxiety, um, CBT plus medication should be considered. Um, let me see here. So we have fluoxetine and sertraline, that's Prozac and Zoloft. They have uh, far more evidence for treatment of anxiety in children and adolescents. Um, and thus, they tend to be the two go-to medications um, in this class of SSRIs that should be considered first line for treatment. Um, all right, moving on to depression symptoms. So depressive symptoms in children are similar to those in adults. Um, I imagine a lot of our students here recognize the acronym SIGI CAPS, um, which identify some of the symptoms we see in depression. Uh, there can be sleep disturbance. Um, adults, we may see difficulty sleeping. In children and adolescents, it's not uncommon to see excessive sleep. Um, there may be a general loss of interest in things that they used to enjoy doing. There may be feelings of guilt, feelings of worthlessness, poor energy poor concentration, poor appetite. Um, again, in children and, and, and adolescents, appetite actually might be increased. Um, and then there could be psychomotor slowing, that'd be slow talking, slow movement, and then um, thoughts of suicide. Uh, symptoms that may be more unique to children and adolescents include irritability. Um, this is a major red flag for depression when comparing to adult symptoms. Um, other common symptoms include mood liability, temper tantrums, um, physical complaints, social withdrawal, um, low frustration tolerance. In the office setting, patients might be uncooperative, um, put little effort into screening questions um, just because they're impatient. Um, other red flags might include decreasing participation in school or extracurricular activities, uh, decreased academic performance, and a lack of interest in spending time with peers. All right. So depression treatments. So psychotherapy is again, first line treatment for depression um, of mild or moderate severity, um, but without suicidality. So that cognitive behavioral therapy, um, again, is uh, first line. Interpersonal therapy and family therapy of all evidence supporting treatment. So for moderate to severe depression or any depression with suicidal thoughts, um, psychotherapy plus medication treatment is, is the go-to. Um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, are first line. Um, of the SSRIs, fluoxetine, that's Prozac, um, has really the most robust evidence for um, 
treatment and tolerability. And it is uh, also FDA approved for treatment of depression. Lexapro uh, also has really good evidence for um, effic efficacy and it is also FDA approved. Uh, Zoloft does not have uh, an FDA indication, but it has a robust support in literature and is also a very good, very well tolerated medication. So some side effects to um, know about when considering starting an SSRI or being on an SSRI. Uh, generally, as a class, these are well tolerated, but they are not entirely benign. Um, if side effects are to occur, they are likely to present in the first few weeks of treatment. Some of these side effects include uh, GI side effects like nausea, diarrhea, weight changes, appetite changes, it could be dry mouth, headaches, uh, somnolence, poor sleep, dizziness. Uh, some of them can cause uh, nervousness or tremor. And um, somnolence and GI symptoms or sleepiness and um, stomach problems, they generally resolve in just a week or two or with a dose reduction. So all SSRIs come with a black box warning. Um, Any time you're considering starting an SSRI on a child, um, there's going to be this increased risk for suicidal thoughts. The studies that uh, have reviewed this show that these thoughts go all the way up to age 25. Um, this increase is really small, 0.7% over placebo, but the research findings did not show any actual completed suicides. These were generally or not generally, but entirely limited to thoughts or behaviors. Um, nevertheless, this is a conversation that you should have with your provider before considering an SSRI. So behavioral activation um, and agitation is more likely to occur in younger children um, and when treating anxiety versus depression. So starting an SSRI on an anxious younger child, um, some warning signs might be motor or mental restlessness. They might be sleeping very poorly, uh, have increased impulsivity, uh, talking fast, aggression. Um, this would usually occur in the first month of treatment or with any dosage increase, um, but should resolve with discontinuation of the medication. Um, So a more severe concern with any SSRIs is the serotonin syndrome. Generally not a concern unless we're going on dosages above the recommended uh, level for treatment, or if we're changing between two medications, or if we're combining um, SSRI medications or other medications that impact serotonin. So some concerning symptoms here after these changes or starting a medication with, within 24 to 48 hours, um, there might be mental status changes like anxiety, confusion. Um, there might be neuromuscular hyperactivity with tremors, um, hyperactive reflexes, maybe rigid muscles, um, autonomic hyperactivity. You might see sweating, uh, increased heart rate, um, or even diarrhea. So this is a medical emergency. So if there is ever any concern for this, this should be um, an ER visit for sure. So a little bit more on um, SSRIs here. So Prozac um, is the most studied anti antidepressant and as mentioned, has that FDA approval in children. Um, it really is a, a great go-to for depression, and it's my first choice for children. It is known to be an activating agent, um, which can be very helpful for those children who have more vegetative symptoms of depression, just no motivation, not seeming to be um, activated or motivated. Uh, Prozac can be a really good option for them. On the other side of that, that activation can actually exacerbate anxiety. So. I take that into consideration anytime I am uh, treating anxiety. Another thing that's really nice about Prozac um, it has a very long half-life. Um, thus, it's a really good option for those that have a hard time remembering to take their medications. 
Um, search lane is another first line that we had mentioned. Um, I don't know that I have anything new to offer there. Um, Lexapro or escitalopram um, is considered one of the purest SSRIs. And that basically means it doesn't really react with any other medications. Um, so it can be taken with most things without um, great concern there. So treatment for adolescents with depression, um, there was a TADS study that showed best outcomes for improvement at 12 weeks of treatment. So we see a lot of um, failed treatment very early in the treatment process. And unfortunately, a lot of these medications and the therapy treatments, they do take time. Um, and we do encourage um, that we try to stick through that unless there's really good reason to change. Um, the study also noted that those who had greater expectations of their medications um, generally had greater improvement. And I think that kind of plays into a reason to switch. If um, there's a lot of concern that it's not working yet, then that may actually impact outcome. Um, so we really want to emphasize that 12 weeks is really an adequate trial. So failure of an SSRI is generally defined as less than a 50% improvement from baseline symptoms. And that's over an adequate and consistent trial. So we should have that over 12 weeks and consistently taking that medication and at a therapeutic dose. And at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Rawlings. Thank you. I also just want to say, no, we focus a lot on uh, side effects and talk about that, but of course it's always a risk benefit discussion with our patients, right? We don't want them to go long periods, having functional impairments, missing out on important pieces of their life. So that should be weighed against those side effects to make sure we're making a really thoughtful balanced decision with our patients. And we know that, um, for treatment resistant depression, sometimes just adding in more CBT sessions can actually get you better than switching medications. I always think that's worth thinking about and wondering about the quality of therapy some of our patients are getting. All right. So we were kind of on the ground level there talking about like identifying risk for depression and anxiety. I'm hoping to bring you up a little bit to the mountain view, because this is the question I always get, which is what's being done. What can be done? What should we consider? And a lot of this is unknown. Um, we talked about developmental impacts and they're still occurring. So hopefully we're going to get more research and understand a bit more, but in the meantime, our field is asking some great challenging questions, which is how are we going to address this crisis? and what are some unique strategies? So many have been reviewed and proposed. And what's exciting is um, there have been some good federal and state level funding options available for some of these strategies as well. So the, really the goal of these strategies is to provide a path for mental health access, treatment, and integration for children and teens to ensure they're getting access to care when they need it and where they're seeking it out. So it's not always in my office, right? It's in schools, it's in primary care. That's really important. Um, so I imagine this is well known, hopefully to everyone listening, but there's a severe shortage of behavioral health providers across multiple disciplines um, in our state of Michigan and across the country, of course. And Michigan has many very pockets of um, health professional shortage areas. So the supply of mental health professionals is not meeting the demand. Um, and then of course, COVID-19 is accelerating this with higher provider burnout, and that's uh, adding to problems as well. So some strategies, you know, as we're talking about shortages, we can find ways to expand um, our skill sets and our workforce. So strengthening system capacity, this might look like unique um, options in terms of loaner payment for necessary behavioral health uh, professionals once they're employed, or even some unique ideas are at the undergraduate level saying if you're invested in a mental health profession, uh, maybe you'll get a scholarship and some career opportunities once you're placed, which I think is kind of an exciting idea. Uh, we also find ways to expand our skill set at larger population levels. One example of that is in primary care. So I think, um, you know, 
working to integrate within the primary care system and school systems are two great spaces that we need to find ways to do this better. And it's some great works already being done, but I think we have ways to expand. Uh, an example of integration in the primary care space is called collaborative uh, care. And it's a evidence-based model that leads to improvements in depression and anxiety and shows cost savings for patients that are engaged in this type of model. And Michigan has um, come up with some great uh, treatment codes and insurers are getting behind this too. So it's one example of how we're stepping into the primary care office to expand our skill set. As a psychiatrist, it's exciting because I can spend one hour um, you know, supporting primary care to treat anywhere from 10 to 30 patients, depending on a busy or light day, where in my own office, I would only be reaching two or three patients. And so it's just to give you an idea of the differences and how I'm using my time. And hopefully I'm impacting primary care by giving them a skill set they can use exponentially with any patients that walk through the door. All right. Um, schools, of course, <laughs> need to support the address, uh, support to the mental health needs of students who spend most of their time and lives in these supportive settings. And these strategies could include funds to increase, train, and recruit more school mental health professionals and to provide programming to benefit um, student mental health. I was sitting with the director of student mental health services for a dinner tonight. We we're talking about, um, you know, mental health first aid and how that's a free training and available and getting more school personnel trained and delivering that could be one useful strategy. So I thought I would talk just a little bit into school because, um, what's next slide? Oh yeah, I got to advance my slides too. <laughs> doing two things at once. Um, but I thought I would talk a little bit about the impacts of COVID. We've talked a lot about it from a developmental perspective, but specific to the school system, you know, initially school closures were limiting access to mental health treatment. I think many of us forget that a majority of students, especially um, those of ethnic and racial minorities and those of state insurance um, coverage, are getting majority of their mental health treatment in the school system. So making sure that um, now we're revisiting that space and that they're getting those needs met is really important and they didn't have it over COVID. Um, schools, of course, were challenged, as we know, with how to connect and, and deliver virtual academics while also supporting the well-being of their students. And then we know youth are just experiencing traumatic stress from COVID-19 itself, from um, family stressors that are occurring alongside them in this journey too. So some school solutions that have been proposed and ones I just thought would be worth thinking about um, include universal screenings. So we're more likely to capture kids in the school setting when screenings are done and we're more likely to get them entered into a um, treatment pathway. So this can look like general depression um, screenings, which are like the PHQ-9A. We kind of skipped over that to make sure we could get to some good rich discussion later, but um, that's one example. And uh, GAD7 for anxiety is another. So just making sure universal screenings are being done and offered to students is really important. Um, promoting positive relationships. We know when students feel more connected to adults in their lives, that this is protective for their mental health needs. Um, this can look like protection on many levels, but we know it's also been shown to um, improve treatment around depression and suicidality. Um, supporting curricula in school settings to address social emotional skills that um, are critical foundational skills for students. Um, and there are many evidence-based ones available, but making these available and hopefully, in, you know, increasing the workforce to deliver these and to uh, be present with students is really important as well. Of course, we need to support educator well-being. We know teachers are going to extraordinary measures to educate and to provide support and to be present with their students. And this is taking a toll too. It might be helpful to look at EAP structures and to make sure that um, they're getting access to necessary mental health services themselves. Uh, Michigan received funding through the uh, Federal American Rescue Plan specific to improving behavioral health in the school settings that could be utilized to improve the workforce as well. Um, and some schools are even partnering with mental health facilities in the area to create uh, and utilize telehealth to deliver their services uh, to their students as well. And of course, trauma-informed school approach is um, an evidence-based framework that outlines guidance for schools on how to train their personnel to work with students and recognizing trauma and implementing that into their work. And it kind of helps shift the thinking from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. And there's um, some good curriculum available. I share, I'll share that in the next slide. So I just found these nice school resources that were 
true to our state. Um, maybe some of you know other ones. Please share them in the chat if you do. Uh, the SAMHSA funds the MHTTC network, and that's a national one, which is a collaborative network for resource development, dissemination, training, and technical assistance for the mental health field um, in the school settings. And there's many trainings available on that website. The National Child Traumatic Stress Network has um, a good uh, series and video trainings as well. And of course, the state of Michigan has a really lovely mental health website, if anyone's looked at there, for resources for their school system. Over here. All right, I have a couple of little add-ons here that um, I found as I was researching material for this slide or for this presentation. I think that it's just good information to share. Um, one of the studies I was looking at um, found that during the pandemic that uh, routinization in families really helped mitigate many of the mental health challenges of preschool age children. Um, they, they looked at just six different things and found that they were um, very helpful for these kids. So it was working parents having regular playtime with the children after work, uh, children doing the same thing each morning as they wake up, family has certain family time um, each week that they do things together at home, um, children's having special things that they do or ask for each night at bedtime, such as story time, good night kiss, even simple as a drink of water, um, children going to bed at the same time, and then the whole family eating together. Um, as I looked at this list, I just thought it was really interesting that a lot of these are very simple additions to creating a more routinized um, atmosphere at home and, and the data supporting that this really helps the, the child's mental health. I also thought of a lot of this when we were discussing with the medical students and pre-meds about getting routines in our lives and how that can be um, helpful with our own mental health. Um, one additional piece here that I wanted to add as well, um, for families who really are concerned about um, getting help within the school system with a child that seems to be struggling, um, a couple of different options are the IEP or 504 plan that we'll talk a little bit about. So an IEP is um, a plan for a child special education experiences um, for them at school. The 504 plan is designed to provide additional supports and remove barriers that are um, giving them difficulty learning. Um, what do they do? The IEP provides uh, an individualized plan to meet a child's unique needs, while the 504 plan provides specific changes to the learning environment that really allow that student to stay in the classroom alongside their other peers. Um, to get an IEP, uh, the child must satisfy two requirements. Um, first, that child must have one of 13 specific disabilities. Um, second, this disability must affect the child's academic performance. So some of these disabilities include specific learning disabilities, such as dyslexia, um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, autism spectrum disorder, um, emotional disturbances, including depression and anxiety. Um, the 504 plan is a lot more flexible um, in that it can include any disability that interferes with the child's ability to learn. Um, what is an independent education evaluation? So if the family um, does not agree with the school's position on the child's disability, they can request an independent educational um, study. Uh, the school may or may not um, decide to do that. The family can, however, uh, seek that independent evaluation outside of the school district. Of course, that's going to be at their own cost. Um, this is not an option at all with the 504 plan. Um, so the IEP um, will establish specific learning goals for the child um, and the services provided by the school. Um, it is a very specific written document um, that will include times, services, uh, specific accommodations, and specific modifications to the education plan. Um, and if the school makes any changes to that plan, they have to give that to the parent in writing. A 504 plan um, is again more flexible, it doesn't necessarily have to be a written document, and it just it generally just includes the specific 
the specific accommodations and supports for the child, who's going to provide those supports, and the person responsible for ensuring that the plan is actually implemented. Um, thankfully, neither of these services come at any cost um, unless the family needs to uh, pursue one of those individualized um, education evaluations. And that brings us to the end. We're happy to uh, Yeah, we thank you so much for coming and happy to answer any questions at this point. Dr. Chubb, will you help me with the microphones? Thank you. He'll cover one half of the room, I'll cover the other. And um, for those of you that are joining us online, please, you could put your questions in the Q&A because we do have somebody here with us from Michigan State that will help with those. Looks like we do have one question here. I have a lot, so, <laughs> um, but I'm happy to share. So one of the recommendations you made was that schools could begin doing universal screenings, right? Um, so we're all familiar with like the GAD, the PHQ. Um, there's obviously a lot of... Um, parental concerns about what's happening in schools right now. We know like the political climate that surrounds that. And I'm just wondering, um, two questions about that. Number one, like from a legal standpoint, like how do we kind of do that? And then, um, and you might not be able to answer that. I understand where your expertise lies. But then also the second question um, I have about that as an educator is the state of mind that a student is in when they fill that out and like how you get the best understanding of where they're really at. Are they moderately depressed? Are they really severely depressed? If you get them kind of at the wrong time versus the right time, or if there is even such a thing as that. Great, great questions. And yeah, you said, um, you know, we'll know where our expertise is. If there's a school community member that wants to jump in too, let's make this like a nice multidisciplinary presence, please. Um, from a mental health perspective and a clinical perspective, uh, screenings, you know, generally are recommended for depression, anxiety to go down to age 12. So I'm not sure when you mentioned like the legal aspects, were you thinking more, how do we do that in a way that's like respectful of parent, child, mental health seeking and confidentiality around their mental health? Is that kind of what we're hitting on? Okay. I'm seeing you not. Yeah. So I think screenings are, you're able to do that just fine. And you're really, I mean, the goal is to pick up at risk kids. It's not necessarily, or kids with some early symptom development, and maybe by chance we'll get some with later symptom development, but it's not necessarily to use as a diagnostic tool to say your kid has this. I think the language you want to say is this looks concerning for more you know, um, mood symptoms that I would really like you to discuss with your primary care physician, or, you know, would you be open to meeting if you have one in your school with our counselor and to get that conversation started. And then it's always a conversation starter. So as you pointed out, our students fill those out sometimes on the worst days where they just had a fight with a friend or they just had a really bad test. And so um, that might impact how they're filling it out. But I still think that's worth the conversation because to me, that's still maybe a vulnerable at risk youth. If, you know, a situational stressor allowed them to have that much symptomatology, I want to hear more about them. I want to, I want to be concerned about them, keep eyes on them. And those would be students that maybe could benefit still from more services and support from a mental health perspective. I hope that's helpful. We do have a question online that we'll go to next. Yes. Yeah, so the, the question online uh, says they work with several small schools in the Diocese of Saginaw. Only three of the schools have a full-time counselor and all the counselors have been barely keeping their heads above water with all the crises going on with our K through 12 uh, students and trying to find psychological support for those students in crisis. It became clear that mental health support is in very short supply, even for emergency cases. Do you have any sources of potential support for schools? Yeah, well, that's fine. That mimics our conversation at dinner <laughs> that we were having, which was um, some students rotating in the thumb and talking about the same struggle. You know, what do we do with under-resourced schools and how to support them? And some ideas that were coming up at the table where, I mean, you could, if you have the right parent and child, use some self-guided materials like workbooks, CBT workbooks um, to get them started. Uh, but I would also say that like the um, 
mental health first aid was a suggestion that came up that's easy to implement. It's less hours of training. It kind of allows more personnel to get trained in that and recognizing um, some strategies that they can utilize with students that can at least get that pathway started while they're waiting for these long wait lists to get into a therapist's office. And then telehealth. I think we should be utilizing telehealth more. Maybe you're already doing that. And this is frustrating to you because there's wait lists there too. But I think I would just try to forge new partnerships with different telehealth options. And if one's not working, go to a different county. County. That's the magic of COVID is we've been able to really, you know, um, mobilize other resources available to us. Thank you. We have a question here. A question and statement. I'm Jerry Seals. I'm a school board member for the Saginaw Public Schools. We have about 6,000 students. We have a mental health worker in all 10 elementary schools. Okay. So we put those in there. Plus we have on a loan to us from the ISD, the Saginaw ISD, uh, we have support from that. And so the person who asked the question needs to go to mental health and see if they can uh, uh, partner with them as we have done uh, to have those mental workers in the schools. The, it is necessary. And I promise you they are busy with that because you're right. Our counselors are so busy uh, doing other things you know, probably not counseling, testing, you know, all the things that counselors do. But I, the question I had for you is this, as I looked at this data that you have presented today, one of the things I wanted to look at, the disaggregation of the, the uh, data, because I'm just wondering whether or not there is more impact on a rural area, perhaps, or African-American, um, Latinx, Native American, I don't know. Have you seen, did, did, you, did you break it down so you can see where there was more impact as a result of COVID, you know, uh, the impact of COVID? First of all, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and helping address that question. It really, it really was lovely. Thank you. Um, additionally, I did um, sit recently at our, we have a child and adolescent psychiatry conference. It's a national conference where speakers come and somebody did present data that rural areas and ethnic racial minorities are getting hit harder. So they have higher rates of depression, higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of behavioral disturbances. Um, and uh, the suicidal rates in black youth for a first time in an alarming amount of our history is um, surpassing that of white youth. So it's something that we are hearing in those group needs. Um, those groups need special considerations, more services, and we need to understand and research that better too. Thank you. Other questions from the audience, the in-person audience, I should clarify. We're gonna take one here in the front. We'll go over there next. And then we do recognize there's more questions came in online. Um, given the efficacy of CBT combined with a psychotropic medication in terms of outcomes for our students, it, it seems at times that, um, and I'm probably casting a really wide net here. I apologize for doing so. I just wanted some input on it. It seems at times that there are uh, groups of primary care physicians that are um, hesitant to uh, prescribe any types of psychotropic meds. Can you can you speak to that issue at all and help me as a school counselor maybe understand that a little bit better? I think he was going to ask your position. So as a school counselor. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for the great question. I'm sure you're um, challenged sometimes with partnering with primary care and trying to help them move treatment along as you know, the wait times for psychiatry in general is so long. Uh, but yeah, primary care, I think, if we think about a medical school, right, we have medical students here and pre-med students, um, some of the uh, time that they get spent on their mental health rotations, if any, might be very minimal. And then it's up to those primary care physicians, I think, to seek out continuing education or practice support for mental health treatment. As a result, we see very varied practice in terms of primary care. We have some offices that are very strong that seek that out, uh, make those partnerships, and some that do not. And that's where I get excited about integrative approaches, partnering social workers that are co-embedded and located in the primary care office to help increase the behavioral health literacy of those primary care offices and to help them with psychoeducation around medication outcomes even. And then as a psychiatrist, that's something that, uh, that we're trying to do too. So that looks 
products like education, um, doing unique models like collaborative care. Uh, there's statewide education to MC3 is a program out of the University of Michigan that specifically provides training videos for primary care offices on a lot of mental health topics, but specifically depression and anxiety too. We've got a question back here. While I'm heading there, I failed to mention that with this session being recorded, all those who officially registered will receive a copy of the recording. So any of the links and so forth, you didn't have to furiously write those down. Your question. Uh, when thinking about implementing these programs and accommodations in schools, particularly when thinking about children and adolescents and their families who may be more concerned about their image or what they what their social standing is basically, do you foresee any issues with encouraging these children and their families to use these accommodations, um, especially when thinking in rural areas where their personal lives really aren't as personal and everyone kind of knows everyone? <laughs> so your um, your question was thinking about the like people that are hesitant to use services because they wonder about how that's going to impact how their school views them or how their peers view them. Yeah, we do see that a lot. I think it's important to have that collaboration with the parent, the school, and um, the teen or youth utilizing it to make sure we can do it in the, the least intrusive way. I say this as the psychiatrist, educators, and school social workers may have a different take on that. But I think it's really important that those conversations are happening so we can, um, for example, if a kid gets an accommodation to take a school break, maybe it's done at a more natural time, like transitioning between subjects, so it doesn't make them stand out too drastically with their peers. And of course, the kid and the teen is going to guide a lot of what makes them more socially anxious, so we can be thoughtful about how to modify that in the school setting. But I think it's really having those conversations and trying to make it as specific to the kids' um, concerns, because um, those are valid and they're, you know, worth exploring. I have a couple online here. Just Does want to add to that real quick too. You know, the destigmatization de is is really happening in real time these days. Um, we got to see that um, really happen just this afternoon as we were having our meeting with the medical students and some very open language about treatment that they had sought themselves to keep themselves healthy. So um, keep that out as, as medical students and pre-med students. That's really important um, just to be open, honest, and keep uh, the destigmatization of mental health um, in, in movement. That's really, really important. Is there a time frame in which you recommend contacting a parent from the time when the screener is done in school? I'm thinking that if we do a universal screener in school, we don't have the manpower to reach out immediately. Is there a liability associated with a universal screener? Well, you could think about the screener you use. <laughs> so if you're using like the PHQ-9, there is a question in there about safety. And if that was a response of yes, I would say then the, the school would need to have a plan for follow-up with a parent or caregiver. There are PHQ-2s that you can deliver that might be a good starting place. They're not as meaningful, they but they can get the conversations going. PHQ-2 is just brief question about depression or irritability in the last two weeks that can prompt further questions. So um, yes, I think if it's regarding safety matter that would the school should have a plan laid out um, to make sure they're notifying parents. And um, otherwise, you know, you could pursue other channels for having those conversations with parents, but I would say making sure you have a systematic approach so you're following that. And what is mental health first aid and how do we connect with this program? I might rely on someone in our audience who was sharing it earlier, who is more familiar with it, if you don't mind. If you can introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Um, my name is Brett Boswinkle. I'm the director of the Campus Mental Health and Wellness Center here at Saginaw Valley State University. And um, Mental Health First Aid is an eight-hour course that anybody can take, regardless of education level. You don't have to be a mental health professional. In fact, it's probably geared more towards a non-professional audience so that it can be used by anybody. Um, there are some agencies that offer it that there may be a, uh, like a nominal charge to attend the training, but there's a lot of grant funded uh, training occurring so that, that does make it free to the user. Um, off the top of my head, I know there is one here in the Saginaw area that's offering the trainings free. I, 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 unfortunately, I just cannot remember 
the name of the agency currently. We do offer those here on campus at SVSU, and that's going to be on an ongoing basis with plans to expand it to allow community partners to come in and do it. It's an evidence-based model, essentially teaches a person how to identify what a person, what it may look like when a person is struggling with a, a mental health condition um, and how to engage in a conversation with that individual about it in a way that encourages help and then active listening and encouraging them to seek uh, professional help, self-help, uh, those types of things. It really just provides a very good um, kind of non-professional understanding of what mental illness is, what those signs might be, how to engage in the conversations and how to connect that person to appropriate resources. One commitment that I can make to those here in the audience and also online is um, we will get that resource directly from our campus mental um, health and wellness, and we will share that as part of the recording. So we've got a commitment. Um, that's why I love the partnerships that we have with Michigan State, my Michigan and such. So we will get that to all of you. Youth Mental Health First Aid is another, my name is Kathy Maycumber. I'm the um, uh, director of the BSW program, the Bachelor in Social Work program here at Saginaw Valley State University and the assistant dean in the Health and Human Services College. Um, I am a trained youth mental health first aid trainer and provided the first uh, youth mental health first aid training uh, at the Saginaw Public School District this past August at their professional development day. Um, we have made a commitment at Saginaw Valley State University to provide these trainings as low cost or free as possible to get this information out. We want to be able to train as many um, school districts. We would we started with the behavioral health and social work um, providers in the second public school district. We would like to be able to train parents. We would like to be able to train first, um, uh, you know, the first people that that individuals come in contact with when they walk into a school. So front office staff and anyone that we can to identify and understand what symptoms, what um, uh, signs they are looking for to provide service, to provide help uh, to young people. Uh, youth mental health first aid is up to age um, 18. And so we are uh, very interested in getting that information out. There is another training. And so one of the things that happens with this mental health first aid um, program across the country is if you become a trainer of youth mental health first aid and you give three trainings, then you can go and get your teen mental health first aid training. And the teen mental health first aid is to train young people themselves, young people themselves to be peer mentors, to be peer advocates, to be individuals who can recognize in each other um, the signs and symptoms of uh, anxiety, depression, um, uh, issues that they're having with their mental health. So we would like to bring that to the Saginaw, the Great Lakes Bay community as well. Um, and so I will make sure that Dr. Lang has information on being able to reach out to me and to SVSU to talk about how can we bring that, that training to your community. So thank you. We did have somebody in the chat uh, mention that Saginaw CMH was offering the mental health first aid and they provided a link, um, but they weren't sure if it was still uh, with that organization. Uh, another question online, what are you finding provides most support to parents of teens that may have, may having, may have a lot of difficulty with anxiety and depression? Saying, um, what to support them in general. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, it can start with a whole host of things as we talked about, you know, getting mental health treatment is one option. Um, but certainly having the kid and the parent develop like a toolkit of self-care can be really useful. And parents can review that um, with their children and teens too. And it can help reinforce if they both want to look at strategies that could be like building routines, setting a sleep schedule, connecting with positive social connections. Um, and again, those are things that can also be done while waiting for uh, therapy to take place. Um, so I have another question with the pandemic. And I think 
in Michigan specifically, we've seen huge, a huge increase in access to um, THC, right? And vapes and just all kinds of addiction, all kinds of drug access now, right? For students. And I think the research is out, like the data is out. And we know that there's a huge increase amongst adolescents with increasing kind of like risk-taking behaviors that are normal. Um, but we're talking about using all kinds of drugs, not just THC, like, like shrooms, acid, like there's all kinds of access now that they have out there. And I'm, I guess I'm kind of asking if there's anything that you can speak to about um, how to simultaneously kind of attack two fronts now. We're not just dealing with mental health, mental health anymore. We're dealing with like self-medicating pra practices and then also the addiction that comes along with that. And I, I just don't know if you're in your expertise or in your experience, if you can kind of speak to how to address that um, in the most caring way possible to help teens specifically um, cope with some of those like multi-faced struggles now. Well, it's such a good question. I'm first going to come at it from my perspective, and there's probably a lot to consider. Uh, I think when we talk about some of the developmental regressions or missed opportunities, I also think that's a rich opportunity for a teen to explore what does work for me to manage the here and now, and substances can play a role in that, and that is often what they might be turning to. Um, I work with kids who are in like a residential facility for substance use treatment. And we often, it's very common to see substance use entry start at like vulnerable times, stressors for it to come into play when they didn't have alternative coping strategies or maybe utilizing therapies. So I try to see it as a framework of like, what is it um, taking place of that we want to try to explore? Is it, did you get that started to help with sleep or to manage feeling more socially comfortable when that is really uncomfortable for you? Are you doing it to manage stress? And can we replace that with better stress management? So I try to understand where they're coming from to validate that that must have held a function for them at a period of time. And then to try to move it into a treatment space. Like how do we look at other tools that we might say um, have healthier benefits or less risks compared to the substances? And that's not an easy conversation. <laughs> that's multiple conversations that's multiple adults on our you know um, team approaching it I think having conversations with parents is important too because they're in a weird space of you know how permissive of this do we allow if we know that they're struggling and then what boundaries should we be putting down so helping families identify what those boundaries are and making sure that um, they're in place and that they have clear you know conversations about it and consequences if it's something that they don't um, fit into their family values we want to be mindful of our time, um, especially with our presenters. We'll take a couple more questions in the audience here. We've got one more online as well. Hi. So my question is, as someone who is completely untrained, and keep in mind, I'm asking this about people I have very little control over. How do I help my friends and family who I see may be struggling with their mental health? Uh, it's a very open question, obviously. Um, I think it really comes down to very simple things for what you can do is like, let them be seen. Um, let them know that, that, you know, that you're there to support them. Um, that's, that's, I mean, that's the simplest piece of that. Um, if there's some relationship between the two of you, then just be that safe place for them. Make sure that they know that. Um, I like some of the other ideas here, um, the mental health first aid, maybe there's additional skills there. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of when people are struggling, they just need to have someone in their corner. Um, so you can definitely be that for them. Do we have a, a final question from the audience here? All right. None of you know who Phil Donahue is, but that's who I feel like. <laughs> Hello. So um, with the recent conversation with mental health and how people are more open nowadays compared to how it was way back then, there's less of a destigmatization, but it's definitely still present. So in the case that a kid understands these um, or may feel some signs or nuances of like their mental health and what might work for them, what happens if 
their family would be less supportive or are still not as aware of that like if they're not as supportive this is usually the case in like ethnic or cultural or minority households i can say that from experience but what would what can we do to address this and again are there any legal concerns especially if this this child is a minor Um, oh, that's a great, great question. All these questions have been so good and are really helping me think about, um, you know, a variety of ways to approach that. I think if a youth's coming from a non-supportive, you know, framework for their mental health needs, we do see that often. What you described is common. I think it's important for us to think about what they need. And we know su having support is protective for their mental health too. So it's identifying who is that if it's not necessarily their caregiver or parent and trying to build upon that strength. We've had kids who identify coaches, um, family members, people outside of the home unit that can provide significant support. I always um, want to be confidential. I mean, when they're in my office, though, we're already kind of stepped into, you know, you're getting mental health treatment. So it's a little different, but they're, if they're in a setting where you can be confidential with them, that's most important. Uh, bringing the parents in for some psychoeducation, if child's ready and have, or teens ready, and they have your support could actually go a long way. It could be, let's have that conversation. Let's talk about what we're noticing and the symptoms and to be more factual about it. So we're being very concrete and giving some data around like, here's how depression can look kind of what we talked about today. Here's how treatment can look. And you know, what is that bringing up for you as a family? What do I need to know about? There are cultural things that I'm not going to know about every family and I need to know to make sure that I'm partnering well with them and to get the kid everything they need. I don't know that there's a clean solution for this, but um, I think another big answer that we really need to take care of is just more diversity in the mental health workforce. Um, people tend to trust people that look like them and we just really lack uh, minority people in, in mental health in general, so. Okay, one final question. Is there data showing an increase in other co-occurring conditions such as disordered eating along with depression and, and, and anxiety? I'm saying heads nod, yes. Uh, eating disorders also were a stat, you know, we thought where could we present the bulk of concern that most people hopefully are going to be able to connect with in depression and anxiety, but we're missing out on a lot of other co-occurring issues, right? ADHD certainly had some changes over COVID. Eating disorders is a big one too. And working with primary care physicians, I get this question quite frequently that they're seeing teens on that cusp of, you know, um, eating issues. And when is that merging into an eating disorder? And when should we be more concerned? And I think they're like just getting more information from them is really helpful, but trying to identify, you know, how much, um, how much symptomatology is present, how much functioning issues are going on. But yes, the comorbidity exists and it's higher also during the pandemic. At this time, we'd like to thank all of you here in our in-person audience and also joining us virtually. Um, and a special thank you to Michigan State College of Human Medicine for bringing us together, for inviting us to the table for some of these conversations. We appreciate the partnership that we have with you. We also are very grateful to have that partnership with my Michigan Health in Alma College for this Your Health Lecture Series. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to give a rousing round of applause to our guests. And it I would encourage you to visit the MSU CHM website to find out more about the Your Health Lecture Series because this is presented here at Saginaw Valley Campus one time each year, usually in the fall, but they do travel around the state. So there is an opportunity to learn on different topics as well. Um, but thank you, Travel Safe. Appreciate you bringing your thoughts and ideas to the conversation. And thank you to the two of you. We need, we need more people focusing on mental health. We thank the educators that are clearly in the room um, and have made this as their commitment for those children. So thank you, thank you. <laughs>